Welcome back to another interview with Room for Discussion. Take the train out of Amsterdam, go for a walk on the beach, and you won't miss the big factories of Tata Steel and Mauda looming on the horizon. The fumes you see coming out of their chimneys form the biggest carbon and nitrogen emissions of the Netherlands, which is a threat to the Dutch climate agreement. Some people say the factory should have closed decades ago, others are saying they're crucial to the Dutch economy. Yes, and besides climate impacts, there have also been potential connections between Tata Steel's emission and higher cancer diagnosis in the regions. So the only way forward is green, and to do this, Tata Steel will have to revamp their entire business model. Uh, they're betting big on green hydrogen and new factories, and to speak about this challenging transition, we have here today joining us the CEO of Tata Steel NL. Uh, we also just wanted to let the audience know that we will have some time for audience questions later, so um, please wait with any questions until then, basically. And I think without further ado... Please welcome our guest of today, Hans van den Berg. Please have a seat. So, welcome to the UVA. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, today we'll be discussing Tata Steel. We'll be discussing your, your carbon emissions. We'll be discussing your impact on the direct environment. We'll be discussing your carcinogenic emissions. And of course, we are aware that these are difficult topics. So, we would like to take a different approach than you usually might during these interviews. So, of course, there's a lot of people that want you gone. So, we would like to start this interview by giving you three minutes to rather argue the contrary and say why Tata Steel should stay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could have told me that before. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, why, why should we say why should we go, but why should we stay? Um, I think there is uh, several, um, uh, several arguments uh, for that. Uh, I always start with the product. Uh, the product uh, steel, steel is everywhere around us. Um, we, are, we are sitting here below steel, and without this steel structure we would not be, uh, we would not be sitting here. But steel is everywhere, also we, we wash in steel, we live in steel, we drive in steel, we live in steel, the whole society is built on, is built on steel. And um, uh, I think that, uh, and with steel, yeah, you, you've said it here, the cost of steel, mm. um, I think that we, sh we should not uh, export that, but yeah. Make it where we use it, mm -hmm. mm. and actually we use a lot of steel as well. Each uh, uh, people, everyone in the Netherlands is using almost one kilogram of steel per person per day. Uh, so this is this is not small, uh, and that is steel. In, it's in batteries, it's in cars, it's in trains, it's well, everywhere. So one kilogram per person per day, and that is exactly what we make in Amsterdam. Uh, so that that is. Well, uh, sort of a general view on what we make. We make high-quality steel. Eh? We don't make this kinds of steel. We make high-quality uh, steel, which is uh, exported, especially to uh, to other countries in Europe, and then come back, uh, comes back at, as products. Eh? So mm. we export the decoil, and we get back the car. Mm -hmm. eh? So that's the general. Then, of course, uh, because that's what the debate is all about, eh? we will have to do that in a, in a clean and green way. Yep. And circular, by the way. Maybe we come to that, but... Mm -hmm. Steel is an excellent circular product. Eh? Well, about clean, we will come to uh, to talk here. Eh? We are not as clean as we as we want and must be, um, and we are not as green as we uh, will have to be in the future and as fast as possible. Yeah. Um, I think that we have in Amai a great opportunity to do that. A location here in the Netherlands is um, is really good. It's close to the sea. There's a lot of uh, wind power coming uh, coming from the sea in the future. There's infrastructure, there is uh, roads, railways, uh, but also uh, pipelines uh, for, for uh, uh, natural gas mm -hmm. and in the future for hydrogen gas, uh, all this kind of infrastructure. Uh, we are close to Amsterdam, so yeah. there's a lot of mm -hmm. higher educated people living in Amsterdam <laughs> and coming to, to do nice technical work in our company. Um, so that's all the positives. Yeah, but and then at the same time, we have a lot of local communities very yeah. close to the plants. It's mm -hmm. densely, it's highly, uh, uh, the, the, the population density is very high. So the challenge is to yeah. do that in a responsible manner, I recognize but, also. But yeah. none of this is necessarily specific to Tata Steel and Muiden, of course. There's other steel plants in Europe, there's other steel plants near sea, there's other infrastructure, there's other places with roads. So why should Tata Steel specifically stay in Muiden in the Netherlands? Well, to simply build it from scratch is not so easy. Yeah? Mm. So if you can build it on, on what you already have, yeah, and we will 
replace almost half of the of the of the site of the company, but the other half is uh, the 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 processing of the steel. Uh, we, we're mm -hmm. talking a lot about about say liquid steel uh, production, but after that it's it's being rolled, it's being it's being uh, covered with uh, with the zinc, for instance. That's why the cars don't uh, don't rust, and this material is also is not going to uh, to rust. So all that stuff we have in MI at this moment, uh, and then if you look at the uh, at the whole map of, let's say, Europe, eh? if you talk about strategic uh, autonomy, eh? then usually we look, don't look only to the Netherlands, but to yeah. Europe as a whole. We see um, uh, some favorite spots to do that. Eh? Of course, Sweden, eh? you know, there's a lot of yeah. talk <laughs> about steel making in Sweden, where you have the, the hydrogen, uh, the hydro power, not hydrogen, hydro power, for instance. It's also where the mines are quite close. Uh, mines are yeah. close, so that that's indeed in some uh, respects is an uh, ideal spot, although they are building there because hydropower is also limited. They are building their windmills as well. Mm -hmm. and so it's, and it's attracting a lot of industry, so you can't make all the steel in Europe simply in the north of, uh, of Sweden. And then for the rest, you see that the coastal sites, so our side, but also Dunkirk, uh, south of France, for instance, those are also famous uh, or uh, favorable sites yeah. Yeah. For, for all kinds of uh, logistical, uh, logistical reasons. Okay. So, yeah, that, and our site is also ideal in that respect. So. Okay, so we wanted to start off by uh, addressing uh, the topic of carbon emissions. Uh, so Tata Steel NL is responsible for 7% of the Dutch carbon emissions. Yeah. And uh, we were hoping that you could actually make us make sense of that number. Hmm. Um, why does steel making create so much carbon emission? Yeah, um, uh, carbon for steel making is not just to to fire the furnaces or to increase temperature, but it's actually a chemical reactant. Eh? So it's doing the reduction from iron oxide, which yeah. is in ores or, or rust, for instance, and make it into iron. Mm -hmm. That's where the main uh, amount of carbon is used for. It's also to increase temperature. And all the carbon that comes in, in the end, becomes CO2. Yeah. And that's a very energy, but also carbon intensive um, uh, process. That's why it's called hard to abate. Eh? And we thought that, uh, let's say 10 years ago or so, we thought that the abatement or the, the, the changing over from the steel industry would be much farther away than the timelines that we are now talking about. Uh, because another um, substance that has also reductant uh, uh, um, capacity is hydrogen. Yeah. So that's why it's from, from let's say, uh, uh, carbon, coal, or uh, natural gas into hydrogen as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, you and that takes a lot of, of, yeah, of carbon and thus of energy and thus a lot of CO2. Mm -hmm. yeah. You spoke about the timeline of, of the greenifying of the steel industry. And the, the goal of the Netherlands is to reduce the carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, 55% uh, actually, while your goal is only to have reduced it by 30% by then. So could you then conclude that you've started too late? No, yeah. It's, it, there's a lot of figures going on. And actually, the figures are against the figures of 1990. And since yeah. 1990, we already improved 17%. Mm -hmm. uh, so to reach that mm -hmm. goal, we still need between 35 and 40 and 40%. Yeah. So our plan is to, uh, that is the biggest, actually the biggest step. Eh? We have two big blast furnaces as production units. We will take out the biggest one first and then the smaller one, and then there is a lot of other kinds of, of, of equipment which also use uh, either natural gas or uh, some other energy source. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a three, sort of three-stage plan. It's of, of course, there's overlap. But the first big step will be before uh, 2030. But that still, still doesn't talk about the discrepancy. Well, 40 plus 17 is close to 55. Eh? Okay, uh, but, but so... Let's, let's, let's be if it could go faster, we would do it. Uh, so this, this is such a, a large project, one could say, or such a short timeline, and that's where your question, I think, is valid. Eh? Should you not have started before this? Yeah. Um, I think um, we've been working on this since, well, no, sort of the, uh, the Paris Agreements, 2015-16. Uh, um, we've worked for a long time on developing the CCS option, so then you keep your steel That's plant carbon as capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage, yeah, end of pipe solution. So you start with the, uh, uh, the steel plant as it is, 
and you catch the, the, the off gases from that, take out the CO2, store it under the North uh, Sea, and use what's, uh, what's left in that. Um, what do we need to stop the most polluting factory in the Netherlands? It's very simple. Stop the polluting. We demand that you take responsibility and own up to what is happening. For everyone else, join us on our winter's action, 24th of June. For, for more information, you can apply. And for you, you can enter your collection. I have, all, I have one, one already, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Could we please remove the banner Carry on with the interview. so that we can see the stage properly? Please, and thank you kindly. Thank you so much. Um, exciting stuff. And it is, of course, like we said before, this is, these are all sensitive topics. And you mentioned that this is a hard-to-abate industry. It's not an easy thing, transforming all of these uh, heavy industries like steel. There's a lot of mach machinery involved. There's you know, intricate technologies. Um, but if you do look at the percentages that you reduce, um, it seems as if you are moving at a slower pace than the rest of Dutch society. And we were wondering uh, whether you think that this is a, a fair trade-off, so to speak. Um, we go as fast as we can with our plan. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one. And I'm not sure that the rest of the Dutch society is also going at, in at the same pace. If we look at um, the, the demands that have been, uh, the climate agreement with, with industry, with uh, transport, with um, 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 let's say the houses and all that, I think industry is uh, in general is, uh, is quite up to a high pace. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it should, of course, I, I understand the dilemma. Yeah, we yeah. Want, I mean, we have to go as fast as possible. Yeah. The CO2 we emit is for 100 years in the atmosphere. But so you are convinced that there's no way you could go faster than this? If we could, I'm open for, for uh, options and discussions. Mm -hmm. Maybe not for the discussion of exporting it, exporting the, uh, okay. the emissions. So there are That's limits to that discussion? Well, yeah, you can discuss it, of course, but it won't help. Yeah, no, no, no. Mm. So your sustainability strategy is to pivot to green steel. And in the industry, there's not necessarily one definition for this topic, it's green steel. Sounds quite vague. So, could you maybe explain how you define this concept? Yeah, what's green? St green steel is, is normal steel in the end. Eh? It's not a different substance, but it's made in a green way. And um, to be completely green, you sh you have to make it without uh, any emission of, of carbon. And um, yeah, that's that's what we call green steel. And of course, there's different, uh, let's say, stages in that. Eh? So when we, when we start with the first step of, of our project, mm -hmm. this machine will first work on natural gas and can then be switched over to hydrogen. The faster the hydrogen is available at, at let's say, sort of economic prices, we can switch it over. Mm -hmm. But already in the first stage, going from coal to natural gas, there's a huge step to, uh, is being made. In but is it, is it already green steel then? Um, is it green steel? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, you could, what you could do, is, and we already uh, do that, is certificate it. Yeah? So you say, well, I have 50% less CO2 in the way I produce it, so I call 50% of my total production green steel. Uh, that's also done by green uh, uh, electrical energy, for instance. You can buy certificates in that sense. But that's not necessarily a very sound it, it's way. It's not where you want to be in the end. Uh, and that's why I think full transparency and, and, and uh, right norm setting and, and reporting in that sense make it, should make it very clear what you're doing. So to be clear, your factory will be producing green steel once it causes no carbon emissions, bottom line. After the second step and, and the projects that we have to have uh, done there. Yeah. When you go to green hydrogen. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Eh? So the hydrogen has to be made in a green manner. Yeah. Eh? If, uh, you, yeah, good, yeah, all the hydrogen is the same, eh? but... Green hydrogen is made green. Blue hydrogen, for instance, is made out of uh, natural gas. And then again with CCS. Right? So that's, uh, that's what they call yep. blue hydrogen. Yes, and um, with green hydrogen, uh, you are using this step-by-step -step transition. Uh, can we also expect green hydrogen as an energy source to be more energy efficient than fossil fuels? I don't think. That you can say that no, of so because you, in the transition of making the hydrogen, energy is lost. Yeah. yeah generally, yeah? so 
best is to use, if you, for instance, make it out of, of windmills, of electrical energy, to use as much as possible the, the electrical energy in a direct manner. But for the reduction processes, you need uh, the hydrogen, and that, that's not very energy efficient in the end. We will be using, by the way, a lot of el green electrical energy as well in our, in our process because of the electrical furnaces that are also taking over. Do you, just because, uh, to sake my curiosity, do you, know, do you have a number for how much energy will be lost uh, in, in using green hydrogen instead? Like the raw mm. energy, so to speak. I don't know. What I've, on top of mind is about 30%, but I'm not sure. Okay. That can be, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. And uh, if you also, so if you produce one roll of green steel versus one roll of conventional steel, uh, how much more expensive is the roll of green steel? Yeah, we, we expected that, of course, a commercial uh, uh, something, of course, but I think uh, between 25 and 30 percent. So that if you calculate it, that, that's a lot, eh? But if you calculate it in, in the, the way it is used, eh? for instance, in a tin can, the tin can will be maybe a few cents more expensive. And in a car, for instance, it's a couple of hundred euros. So it's not that the car is the twice as expensive. Eh? It's a, but the, that's a part of it. the raw steel, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah. The, the amount of steel in a car is, let's say, a thousand kilograms, at about a thousand euros, something like that. And, uh, okay. So if you, you lose, um, let's say, let's say 30% then of the raw energy in using green hydrogen, and the end product is also around 30% more expensive. Um, so green hydrogen is then, um, at this time, less energy efficient and more expensive. And considering that there will be a lot of competition, so to speak, in demand for green hydrogen, uh, it's not certain that future demand will be able to, um, sorry, future supply will be able to scale enough to meet future demand. So it's possible that these costs that you mentioned will also increase. Yeah. So we're also wondering then, why are you betting uh, big, so to speak, on green hydrogen? Yeah, to get rid of the CO2. And this and is so the only way. Yeah, this, this is uh, the, the only pure way to do it. Another thing maybe to be mentioned is that, of course, this is all, let's say, fresh steel. Eh? So it's steel made in a, well, I don't think it's a totally linear way because you keep reusing it. But the first time you dig it out of the ground. Eh? So once it is steel, you can reuse the steel by simply melting it again. And, 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 and process it, and then you have, again, that will be more and more. Okay, so in, in the plants, we will, have, we will have to include more and more reuse of steel. Okay, so um, you're also talking then about scaling your uh, recycling capabilities. Yes. And uh, how much are you planning to scale them? Yeah, the, the current plants, we are at about uh, 30, 35%, but we are not at the end. Until the 2050. Lessons. Uh, 2035, I would say. 2035. And yeah. do you have a number for 2050? No, I don't have that yet. No, okay. But we will see that there will be more and more electrical furnaces just simply melting, electric mm -hmm. arc furnaces. And that will, in the end, yeah. remove the DRIs. But that will because, take because some one, decades to go. Because one point of criticism for, among others, the, the local population living around your factories is that you are betting on producing the exact same amount of steel as you are doing today, while the European plans and national plans are to grow towards a more circular economy, where there's no more use of direct resources, but rather way more recycling, where your plans are currently also showing a bit of a discrepancy. Well, yeah, but it has to be available. Uh, so steel stays in the, in the society for some time. Uh, well, again, here, these, these steel bars above us, they will take maybe 30, 40, 50 years before, before they come back. Eh? So we, we, will, we will see it rising, the amount of, of uh, reuse of, of steel. Um, it, it can go faster because there is scrap, as it's called, is, is exported from, from Europe. But if, if all the steel would be made in Europe from, from recycled material, there's no scrap enough. Eh? So there will be sort of, of a balance going forward. And the world as a whole, because it's a world market, is still needing a lot of fresh steel. And so the steel consumption in the world, uh, for instance, in India is rising very fast. Uh, Africa will come as well. Will will still be uh, will still be uh, increasing for the next decades. We uh, we expect. But that's not necessarily something that your your factory is anticipating on. It's more in towards the European economy, of course, where the plans are to reduce less steel, or to reduce the use of steel. Yeah. Well, another thing is uh, to make the high qualities of steel. 
that is that is being done by fr by fresh steel. Eh? So if you if you use scrap, scrap is a very if you look at the scrapyard for instance, it's a very uh, how do you say that a diverse product. Eh? There's a lot of there's paint on it. There's uh, other kinds of metals in it, and from from that scrap you can't make the highest the highest qualities of steel, which are used in uh, let's say out out of uh, form of uh, of cars, batteries, uh, packaging uh, kinds of uh, of materials. This is the highest quality uh, steel. Very difficult to make. Very thin and coming thinner and thinner all the time, um, and should not leak, of course. So the circular plan that uh, the European Union then for example, is pursuing, is not entirely realistic in that sense because you still need that high quality steel that you cannot get from scrap metals. Is that true? That's true, but we could diversify more than we do now because we make everything very high quality. Uh, also for, because we, uh, we don't only make the high, highest quality steel. Uh, we make a, a whole a range of steels, of course. And if we could make uh, certain steels which are less critical with more scrap, we will do so. But you are betting, so to speak, against the plan that the EU has for their circular economy. I don't think we are betting against. Eh? We are increasing our uh, amount of recycled steel eh? in the current plans. How exactly step two of the plan is still to be determined. It eh? could very well be that we choose there for more recycling content. Eh? So you will see it phasing out over the, uh, well, let's say, years or decades. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, you also have uh, a few steel companies that are planning to um, start up recently. You have an H2 Green Steel Company in Sweden. Uh, they are saying that they will produce 5 million tons of green steel uh, per year by 2030. Um, and by 2030, you will be producing using gas, right? Depending. Is if there's hydrogen, it will be on hydrogen. But we expect that that will take one or two years, yeah. Okay, to and switch over. when you do switch over to green steel, it'll still be more uh, expensive both to produce and to buy uh, from you. So how are you planning to plug the hole in the spreadsheet? Yeah, well, that, that is depending on competition as well. And it's depending on whether the customers are willing to pay a premium for green steel. But that's an important, uh, important question. And we see that already happening. Eh? So especially where, where uh, the, the end-users markets are sensitive to this. Take, for instance, the high-end cars. Yeah? So we see, uh, we already have with uh, Ford, we have a memorandum of understanding. Yeah, but we see Volvo moving, we see BMW moving, uh, Daimler-Benz, yeah? they're all moving and, and asking for us because they have their goals in 2030 or 2035 to also produce the whole car in a carbon-free manner. And then you need carbon-free steel as well. And that will come at the cost. And so, and we see it in packaging also as well. Eh? So, those are markets that are sensitive, where the end consumers, eh, that, 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 that are we ourselves, are willing to pay a premium to, to have it made in a green manner. So, uh, there is no plan to also subsidize the cost? It's only a transfer of cost from um, the, the green steel to the and, uh, sorry, the next business who yeah. buys the raw material. Uh, to be completely honest, to make the transition itself, eh, where there is, as we see it, some market uh, inefficiencies, because if the market would be completely uh, efficient and would, there would be a complete level playing field, that would be the best situation. And then the business cases are easy to, uh, to work out and all that. And uh, we don't think that's the case. Eh? We see it already happening. The United States have their... Inflation Reduction Act, uh, different uh, governments in the EU are, are, are acting. Um, and we have also asked help from our own government to be able to make the transition, moving towards a new commercial situation where there is, uh, we are, uh, again, a clean competition, but at a higher price. Okay, so most likely there will be some subsidies involved. We have asked for support. Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. you... We, uh, that's also because we, we see that all the European steel companies are, are, are asking for, uh, for this and are getting it. Yeah? So Salzgitter uh, in Spain, Lyon, ArcelorMittal, uh, ThyssenKrupp, yeah? they are mm -hmm. even further yeah. than we are in this, uh, in this. Yeah, the Dutch parliament has also pledged their support uh, to grant you subsidies to start this plan to, to make your process more sustainable. But as of now, before you, before you can start with the process of building these factories, 
you actually need entirely new factories. You're currently building installations to reduce other emissions, to reduce yeah. nitrogen and carcinogenic emissions. Mm -hmm. But currently, your plans to build these new factories that you'll need for this whole process are still on the drawing board. So what are you waiting for? Well, well, it's a, it's a, it's a huge pro uh, project. So there's a lot to be uh, to have in place. Eh? So there is uh, the financing, with, which we just talked about. There's also permitting. Mm -hmm. eh? So we have started the so-called participation um, of um, uh, of the new of the new plans. Eh? We last two weeks we've been in several uh, local communities to well to to show what what uh, the plans are, and people can can have influence on that. Eh? We have already seventy ideas. I understood. From uh, from these, uh, which we will one way or another seem to uh, seem to uh, incorporate. So and that will have in the end uh, has to lead to a permit, and then this is a whole process, of course, very important because well the current um, issues that we have. Then there's technology development as well. Eh? So uh, we have R and D is working on how exactly are you going to make to the transition from from carbon based to uh, to hydrogen based. Mm. So there's, and all these paths are going in a parallel manner. So it Our sounds... to be involved, infrastructure to be involved. Yeah, it uh, sounds like uh, indeed this is a very complex and there's a lot of stakeholders involved. So it could also be very sensitive to delays, of course. Yes. And every year that it is delayed, you have 7% uh, of Dutch carbon emissions coming from your factory. Yeah. Okay, so the stakes are high. Stakes are high. Stakes are high and of course, um, um, uh, CO2 rights, so taxation will kick in as well. Maybe that's good to mention because it's such a large effect eh, that um, and there's a lot talk also about, uh, uh, let's say, for, uh, subsidies of fossil industry. Um, that's especially in the in the ETS system. Eh? We produce uh, six, seven million tons of steel, and we emit the total 12, 12 million tons of CO2. Eh? That's why we. Let's say the number one, 12 million mm -hmm. tons. Of those 12 million tons, we have 10 million tons of free rides and 2 million tons we, we buy. Yeah. And the amount of free rides depends on your uh, distance to the, to the benchmark. And this whole system was, was arranged to have a global level playing field. Yeah. Now, we look now different uh, uh, to this. Eh? We want to reduce CO2 much faster. We want to make green transition. So in Europe, it's now said, well, we will, we will reduce the ATS rights in the end to zero, the free rights. Mm -hmm. And instead of that, there will be a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is a tax shielding, uh, taxation of material coming from outside, which have a lot of CO2 in it. So then we have, have sort of a, a global playing uh, uh, yeah, level playing field again, mm -hmm. but at a higher price. But that means that all the ETS rights will be gone. And if you calculate it quickly, you see that the 10 million tons of free rides that we have now, at a price of close to the 100 euros per ton of CO2, have a total value of, uh, of close to a billion euros a year. And so this whole transition is also driven by that. The faster we go in the CO2 uh, reductions, the lever on that is much larger than in the past. Talking about that delay, your own website says that you are developing new green steel solutions today because the world cannot wait. Do you think that's then a fair claim? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a fair claim, yeah, because well, climate change is real. It is here. Yeah? And um, so we have to move. And I think we have to move, especially in Europe, Western Europe. As we have to lead this transition, I think. Uh, we've, yeah, we have... Well, we've seen it here. We have, we have consumed our carbon uh, budget, actually. Mm. So making this transition, developing the technology, um, making the green, the green steel, see how these market mechanisms work, eh? all these kind of things. Yeah. Where is that better to be done than here in, uh, in Europe? But, <coughs> sorry. Um, so with H2 Green Steel Company, for example, they're planning to produce 5 million tons a year by 2030. Is Aimaide one of those leaders? Well, there will be, uh, let's say, uh, how do you call it, a COP group, um, a, a group of of, uh, of high-end companies which will uh, which will compete in this field. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the matter is, of course, how fast will the demand go? Eh? Is the demand really ramping up as we see it now? Because there will be more and more green steel on the market. 
And a lot of these timelines are, let's say, in the second half of this decade, uh, starting to, uh, to produce. So there will, we will see a completely different yeah, market uh, arena uh, arising. But so will you be in that group of front runners? Yes, of course we will be. Okay, you're, you're you currently... You doubt it, I see. No. <laughs> it's, uh, I, think, I think it's an interesting, interesting fact. Um, you were asking the government to contribute a billion euros. That is something you said in a previous interview. No, 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 no. I've not, I have never mentioned a billion euros. I cannot mention any number here. You've, you've never mentioned a billion euros? No, I haven't. I think, I think that's what you said in, in the interview in the Bali. You oh, gave. the interviewer said it. Yeah, in a previous interview you said you need... I did not comment on it. Oh, okay, so it's... So a it, was, it was taken out by the ANP and the Volkswagen as well. Is it a, a secret number, how much you need? Yeah, it's you a will secret need? number. Okay, why is it secret? Yeah, because it's uh, commercial, because we are um, negotiating with the government, so we don't know what's coming out. And generally, in this kind of processes, yeah, once there is sort of a deal, then is the moment to, um, to communicate it. Uh, actually, it's according to European uh, law, it's not allowed to communicate about it, because it's commercially sensitive. So we see others doing it, by the way, okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's for them, but we and the Dutch government, we strictly keep to this. Uh, but the, the Dutch taxpayers, so to speak, cannot know until the deal is struck. I think, yeah, I, I, I do not know how exactly then the, uh, the House of Representatives is influencing this at what stage, I don't know. But so Maybe to make it, make it more clear, you're asking for a certain amount to finance the construction of these new factories that you'll need. But on top of that, you will also need structural uh, subsidies to compensate for the lack in price difference for between hydrogen and regular steel. On top of that, you'll also need subsidies uh, from the, for the infrastructure of the hydrogen network in the Netherlands. So you have no, you have no estimate on what this is going to cost the Dutch taxpayer? No, I don't. No, I don't. And because we don't know exactly what's, what's, what, what will happen. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If the market picks up quickly, we need less. It, I mean, subsidy is not, it, it's not our business model. It's not our, our way of... It, it, we, we ask for it because we need it to make the transition. So then, but, the, but then isn't it your business model? Uh -huh. But then isn't it your business model? Yeah, may, maybe in a sense, but it's not, it's not a, let's say, an earnings model. No. It's not a, a way that we say, okay, now we have this, uh, these subsidies, and that's the, w that's the way we will keep running the business forever. We want to go as back to normal commercial situation as fast as, uh, as, fast as possible. Okay, mm. so I uh, think... Uh, we have yes. some time for audience questions. Exactly. So, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And we have uh, one of our lovely committee members in the back, and she will come with a microphone so that you can ask your question. Back over there. Oh, it works. Uh, I'm a law student, um, and I'm really trying to be here today as neutrally and objectively as I can and listen to you, and I really appreciate that you're here today. But I cannot deny that I really, really hope, personally, but also objectively, that Tata still have, has to close its doors and that you personally will be sued according to criminal law, but also civil law. And I know that I'm not the only one. Do you understand that? Tough question. Well, I, I don't like it. Um, uh, and I understand it, I would say, partially, because I think um, the intentions uh, that we have, the programs that we have, the, uh, the hard work that we have done for the last years and that we expect to be doing until it's finished, um, I think that I hope that that will get the chance to evolve and to, yeah, to make the transition. I think it's, it's, it's important um, for now, well, let's say the, 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 the company, the, the, the thousands of people who are working there. I think it's also important for the, for the communities around the steel plant. Um, but I think it's, it, yeah, it's more, there's 8 billion people on our planet. And they, they, are, they want safe food, they want transport, they need transport, they have to have a, let's say, a roof above their head, all these kind of things. And those are the products that we, that we produce. Yeah? But we have to go from here to there. So, um, but I also understand the, uh, the impatience and, uh, um, 
and as I've said before, yeah, we, we, maybe we could have started faster. That, uh, so that, that, that also holds against me now, but that's, that's the truth. So I mean, the interesting thing there is, could you have started faster or should you have started faster? Um, with hindsight, I would say that, uh, well, especially with the, uh, with the program, which, uh, which we call the clean, eh? so clean green circuit, uh, the green part, I think we could have picked that up uh, quicker, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this was uh, maybe the second half of our talk will be about it, I think. Uh, so Indeed. Um, after the, uh, the graphite emissions in 2018 um, and the, um, uh, well, the, the big worries after that, then we really picked up. Uh, and before that, we were improving over the years. If you look at all the graphs, you, see, you can easily see that the emissions have uh, reduced and reduced over the years. But we, we did not have the right discussion, I think, with the people around us and, and did not pick up quick enough uh, what their worries uh, were. Yeah. The local, so population, the local mm. population is saying that the conversation still hasn't improved, that it's still not at the level where they want it to be. Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, let's say, I hope we, uh, we have hit the bottom of the valley. Yeah, so it's um, absolutely not where we, where we want to be. Only uphill from now? Hmm? Only uphill from now? Yeah, if it is up to me, uh, I, would, I, would, I would say so. But I mean, it is up to uh, you. Yeah, for a large part. You're right. Yeah, mm. you're right. Mm. Okay, I think we will uh, take one more audience question, if there are any. Yes, we have it here in the second row. Hi, so you mentioned already the, the subsidies from the government, the emissions trading system, but I was wondering if it's up to you, like what would you need from the government, from investors to... Yeah, actually be more quick in this transition. How could they also help you? Uh, I don't know if, if it would be much quicker. Eh? It's, it's one of the things that has to be sorted out, well, let's say, in the, in the, in the near future. Um, well, there is, of course, some, some ideas in, on how business models for the future will and would look like. Um, Uncertainties are an important part of all this. And there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, yeah, uncertainties around the company. Yeah? We, we, we just talked a little bit about the uncertainties uh, in, the, in the communities, uh, the coke and gas plant with the LOD that's there, um, but also the uncertainty on when will then the hydrogen be there, what will be the future market, how will that look like, will, will the, the premiums, will, be, will they be there? Um, yeah, I, I think there uh, good development of business models and of financial models on how to, yeah, to to finance a, a transition like like this um, could be developed. I think I'm, I'm not a real specialist in the end. Our CFO is much uh, much more uh, uh, much better in this kind of in, in this kind of things. But I think that those things. Could 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 really help, and um, yeah, reduction mm. of of risk, becoming uh, having more and more certainties, and maybe government can give some certainties in that sense as well, eh, so that commercial lenders can also um, feel better about it. Yeah, mm. maybe not a complete answer, but uh, I understand your question. Yeah. Perhaps we will also uh, touch on it later. You know, um, so thank you for those questions uh, and. Uh, you already mentioned, but indeed we would like to go into uh, other types of emissions now. So besides CO2, you also emit PACs, that this, which they are called. So it's uh, an emission that when inhaled increases your risk for cancer, among other things. And um, there is more cancer in the surrounding areas around Aymaide, sometimes even 50% more than in other places in the country. And uh, the Institute for Public Health and Environment, or the RIVM, studied your pack emissions and found that in some cases they are up to a thousand times higher than you yourself have stated. Um, why is the plant still operating when these are the numbers? That's a lot of statements and questions in one, I would say. Um, maybe I can, um, can say a little bit about it. Um, um, we know, of course, all these uh, investigations. And we looked upon it, and we looked in the in the cancer atlas, as it's called, cancer map eh, of yeah. uh, of the Netherlands. Um, there is a um, uh, um, 
The difference which we tried to explain last week also in the House of Representatives about what uh, what's deposited, so the more coarse material which is deposited in the, uh, in um, well, especially where I can say, but also a little bit broader than that. And that's in the air. Yeah? What, what are the air um, emissions? Um, and if you look into that, the, um, the last report of the RIVM is about depositions. Mm -hmm. yeah? And they stated that this is the third time that they measure it in the last say, two years, and they could not really see an improvement in what is deposited on the ground. We have presented last week the, uh, the, uh, the measurements of the emissions in the air. Yeah? So that's uh, what you directly uh, in, inhale. And then we see that over the years, a large decrease, and that's where a lot of our projects have been working on as well, um, is, uh, is reached. And the question is now, why is it not visible in the, uh, in the depositions? Yeah, because we have with this what we call the Roadmap Plus program, which we started uh, one and a half, two years ago. We've done a lot of projects. Uh, still, we, uh, projects are running. Uh, the largest project still has to be delivered. Uh, the dedusting of our so-called pellet plant, and it's also involves, involving a denox installation, so taking out the uh, nitrogen oxides. Uh, that has to be delivered. Another thing to be delivered is a large uh, windscreen, which is uh, around our coal and uh, especially coal fields, because we think that the the, the the puck that is found now on the on the ground, and which is which is not good, um, is uh, coal that is well blown off our premises. So that is what we what we are still. Uh, mm -hmm. what we so are still the doing. the measures that you mentioned, the windscreen and uh, so on, they are to be delivered. So yes. why, in the time scale between now and when they are delivered, are you still using the things that are emitting uh, the packs? Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's a dilemma. And um, uh, something that we are really also, well, discussing a lot about, uh, where we have, are taking uh, uh, continuous improvement measures as well, eh? operational Im uh, uh, improvements, uh, maintenance programs to um, to reduce the reductions from uh, from the uh, premises. In our um, um, air side emissions, uh, we've uh, reduced last year 50% uh, and more. So not the depositions on the ground because that's uh, that's coal. That's uh, so uh, that's what we can do. We can reduce and reduce emissions as fast as uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's why our people are working hard on with all these projects. Yeah. I would like to take an example. Um, NS employees, the Dutch railway company, who were uh, exposed to carcinogenic paint, Gromses, are getting compensation uh, payments from their employer. Do you think that you should offer uh, compensation payments to lung cancer patients in the Eimond region? Uh, I, find that, I find that a difficult question. Of course, yeah, but, because if there is some kind of a, um, uh, how do you call it, schade? Uh, Damage. Damage, yeah. Yeah, then, then, and we are responsible for that. Yeah, there, something has to be done. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you uh, if you study the uh, uh, the cancer atlas, we see that we are really high in um, uh, mesothelioma, which is the, the the cancer sort caused by asbestos. Yeah, so um, that's really red around the company, but it's in the whole. Well, in the whole area, eh, there has been a cans uh, asbestos uh, factory as well, but also on our plant. And we used a lot of asbestos with the high temperatures. Mm -hmm. You see the same in the industrial area in Den Helder, yeah. in uh, Rotterdam, south of... Uh, and for that typical kind of cancer, um, there is the uh, International... No, the, in the Institute of uh, um, Asbestos um, uh, Issues, eh, so... If you have this kind of cancer and you have worked in, in our plants, there is a, a special regulation and you get, you, get paid for, you get paid for that. So that's, that's one on one. Yeah? Mm -hmm. because do you, do you then think that maybe there should be a similar institute for lung cancer patients? But lung cancer is very difficult. It is, because there's but a that lot also of makes it easy for you. But there's a, because there's a lot of influencing factors there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, the question is, yeah, uh, uh, do we have a real influence, and how large is this influence? And and well, that is something I, I think we really should talk about together with experts, together with people in the surroundings, and of course our own people, because we feel responsible 
and we 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 feel that 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 uh, let's say the health of our, of our employees, the 9,000 plus the 30,000 that are very regular on our side, uh, including, mm -hmm. including the, the people around us. I mean, these people will uh, never be able to directly prove that the diseases that they got are coming from your plant. The same thing happens to the NS, where they also can't necessarily have direct proof that these two things are related, but there they're taking the precaution anyway and taking these measures, but you're not doing the same. Yeah, well. Um, as I say, yeah, we, we will have to see what, what the influence from A to B is. But how will you see that? Is, huh? How will you see that? I don't know. I don't know. But that's what makes the discussion so difficult yeah. and the dilemma as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, what we, we, we know, of course, about our own people. And I've said it before, yeah, our own people in, that are in our pension plan are older, generally, than... Um, uh, they die older than uh, average in the Netherlands, for instance. And we have every three years, all the employees of our company get a medical uh, checkup. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we can see quite well what the medical situation of, of our own people is on the plant, and they are working there. On the contrary, so there's the example to be made that there are employees that worked at your plant that have criticized you for not even taking their asbestos uh, compensation seriously. Yeah, but that was all settled. That was, I think, two or three years ago, with an article in the uh, in the Volkskrant, and uh, we dived into it, and we we changed the policy. And I I must really say that that uh, that was a uh, for me an eye opener uh, article, because I'm responsible for the whole thing, the whole policy setting, and we dived into it, and what we uh, what we do or what we did as a company when a claim comes in. Specialists look upon it and say, uh, "How likely was it that it was caused here?" Mm. And they were very strict. They were doing their job. They were very strict. And now we've said, "Yeah, if you if you've worked here for 30 years, we don't ask the questions anymore. We simply do that." So we changed the policy here, and yeah, I feel a little bit ashamed that we had to do that um, because I, I think the way that is organized in the Netherlands is is a good way. It's very qu very fast, very mm -hmm. clear. So. Uh, if we so we dealt differently with it after that. Okay. So if we zoom out a little bit here, um, you are for the green transition uh, needing subsidies from Dutch taxpayers, but at the same time with the carbon emissions and the pack emissions and nitrogen, for example, other emissions, you're also putting a burden on Dutch society, which some people say is, is quite high indeed. Um, so the taxpayers are assuming the risk of the transition, considering the subsidies, uh, but they are not necessarily getting any of the profits. Do you think that this is a fair trade? I understand the reasoning, but uh, I think there there are some flaws in that uh, in that as well. Huh? So okay, flawed reasoning. Flaws in the, in the whole in, in in what you say, huh? okay. because the the denox installation which we are Im implementing now yeah. in the uh, in the, the plants, windscreen, for example, the windscreen that that's all paid by ourselves. Huh? So 300, 350 million which we are spending is. We don't, we don't ask, of course, eh, because it's part of our... Uh, only for the big green transition, that's where we, where we need a little, uh, little, uh, a little push. Um, would, you, would you call it a little push? Much, we bring, of course, much more benefits to, uh, to the community. Eh? So it's, it's, this, it's the steel products, well, that's one. But there's technology development, there's the whole uh, R&D and technology development around um, hydrogen. And we have what we call TechPort, which is a, um, a, a working um, uh, institute together with the government and with the, uh, with the local um, uh, training uh, schools and all that. Eh? So that's also, a, a, let's say, um, an, an institute where we, where we do a lot of innovations for the, uh, for the future. Um, well, our people pay uh, hundreds and millions in income tax, for instance. Eh? So there's a lot of things around the company which make the value of the company. Eh? And this has all been calculated by, I think, a, um, Oxford Economics or so, to show that the value of the company is, is of course, much bigger than that. So you uh, think that you are pulling your weight here as well in this trade? Yeah, and, and I, what I just mentioned, eh, the, the change of the ETS rights into the, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that will all be paid then in taxes, eh? that will be slowly decreasing after we do the green transition. 
that the value of all of those taxes are much higher than what we what we are asking now. So it's not completely wrong your your line of reasoning, but there is some comments to, to be made on that as well. I would say, yeah. Okay, um, so the Safety Council published a report two weeks ago, um, ish, stating that the government institutions had not done enough to protect the Dutch people against health risk coming from Tata Steel and L. Um, so as CEO, do you think that the government has failed to regulate you properly? No, I don't think that's, re that's really up to me because there were some advisors on us as a company as well. And we, we are listening to that, I would say, yeah, because we stated that uh, they looked at the government on their way of working. Um, uh, and they look at the company, which they said they could have acted more proactively as well. Mm -hmm. And they're demanding, or they're advising, it's not demanding, they're advising to, uh, to be more involved and uh, more concerned about the emissions that we have and the influence of the emissions on health. And we've always looked upon emissions in the sense of, do we fulfill our, mm -hmm. our permits? Yeah, and the permits are becoming stricter and stricter. Eh? If you look in, uh, in uh, over time, eh? there's more technology, there's more developments, and we will have to adhere to that as well. Mm -hmm. But really being involved in, okay, th this emission, what exactly does it mean for the health in the... Uh, yeah, that's a discussion that we will have to be have mm -hmm. to have more and more, and that's yeah. why they look upon us. But this, this so specific um, question I think it's is about the role of the government. So then do you disagree with the findings in the report about the, about the role of the government in regulating you? No, I find that difficult to judge because they, what basically they say is that both government and company should should be looking more, at thinking of f starting with the health and the effect on health, and 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 not only with the process of how is the norm setting and how is um, how is that implemented and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, I think that, that the relation between the company and, and, and the supervisors has always been very, bus let's say, business-like in the sense of, uh, of quite, uh, quite strict. Yeah. But what the mechanisms behind this that were and how this, uh, what, what the, uh, the council is, is saying, how that is working, yeah, I cannot really have a... Yeah. Will, you, will you welcome more government supervision? Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course, and, and we are supervised all the time. The, the coke plant that we just talked about, we are on very intensive supervision for a certain uh, amount of months. Mm -hmm. So there were supervisors constantly yeah. around the plant to see mm -hmm. whether we were producing and, and, and whether all the installation, etc., are working up to the standards. And that was their conclusion. So they stopped the intense supervision. Eh? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, generally, we, um, yeah. of course, we, we do that. Mm -hmm. And it's all... Um, and also the reports that, that, that we make, yeah, sometimes we, we pay for the report eh, as the reduction for the PECs, eh, the 50%. That was an outside um, a, a consultant, which we paid for, of course. But it's, it's an independent uh, consultant, which you can mm -hmm. uh, yeah. audit and, and see how they have done that. On the other hand, you are also suing the regulatory agency right now because they put a camera outside of the fences of your, of your factories where yes. they're using that to monitor the emissions that are coming out of the chimneys. And uh, the judge will uh, make a verdict this Wednesday. Yeah. And imagine that the judge rules against your favor, says that camera is there, it's justifiable. It should say, there. will you appeal that judgment? We don't know yet. Let's first wait, uh, wait and see. But the point there is not that we don't, do not want to be supervised. We want to be sure that our people are not visible, are not recognizable on the cameras. And if that is a certain, no problem. There's a lot of cameras around it, around our company, uh, by the way, not only by the government. Okay, so um, on your website, again, we're using that a lot of quotes. Uh, it says that you, let's see, so operate in a way that is safe for your people and respectful to the environment, and you behave responsibly and with care towards the community surrounding and impacted by your operations. Uh, but in reality, as you also mentioned before with the graphite snow, you have been found to um, violate environmental laws in the past. So in one way, you are not even meeting the legal requirements uh, of care for your environment, for example. Um, so speaking then again to you as CEO of this company, uh, how can you justify having this statement on your website That's it's a good question. I would say generally we do. 
but we have incidents. Uh, we've had the, the black slow, uh, snow and, and other uh, dust uh, emissions. Um, and there was a part on the, on the cooling of the slack, of the slack pots. And um, yeah, the judge uh, ruled against us. So um, in, in those cases, in those incidents, we did not fulfill, fulfill our permits. But don't you, don't you think you're downplaying but them by calling them incidents? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, especially not on these, eh, because these were really, were really incidents. Eh? And we report all incidents, and there are certain uh, incidents that we report on, which are very closely related to daily operations. Eh? For instance, if you look at, at uh, fumes coming out of the, uh, of the roof of our blast furnaces, we have that two or three times a day, and um, we have uh, we, we report that uh, uh, as incidents. So each day we report two or three of these, these things. One could say, yeah, are those oh, the, are those still incidents? Yeah, that's true. But, but generally, these these four were, were definitely incidents. Yeah. It's a big it, it's a big site, eh? and I'm not downplaying it. I'm I'm just saying not everything is always going 100%. And but, yeah, is that, but is that justifiable? Like, this impact, this, these emissions have a big impact on the local populations, they have an impact on the local climate policy, and then can you just say, well, you'll never get it 100% right? We don't think the, uh, the incidents have a big influence, if you calculate it, mm -hmm. with respect to the total emissions. But one could, could, uh, yeah, could challenge that, but, but we have calculated how much this is upon the total of emissions, and it's a small percentage. The regulatory instance disagrees that there, that there are small incidents. They say these do have an impact. Well, they say nothing about the impact. They say this should not happen. You're not allowed to do this. Mm. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that you have a desire also to be more proactive, and this is something that you are uh, in discussions with, with the government. You also say that uh, a closer government supervision uh, is not anything that you are against. Oh. Um, yet it seems that a lot of these improvements uh, that you have made, the transition to green steel, the uh, closer monitoring of your paths, uh, the windscreen, all of those things, they have been uh, implemented or planned for, some are not implemented yet, after and only after you have received a, a push from behind, from someone, uh, you know, from a lawsuit, from a ruling, um, things like that. So do you feel that you're being proactive enough? Well, we have need, we needed those pushes in the past, and maybe we will need them in the in the future. That would be shameful, of course. Um, but I can I can mention a whole number of projects that have been fulfilled over the years. I think the big acceleration that we are looking for now, we are really pushed uh, by uh, well this kind of of, of uh, expressions, and yeah, it helps to speed up. Okay. Um, and so at this point, um, we mentioned this in our little speech in the beginning, there are uh, a lot of varying opinions in Dutch society about uh, the future of Tata Steel in the Netherlands. Uh, and we're wondering if, if you think that it's realistic that you will operate uh, you know, from now on and onwards in the Netherlands. I think we will have to hurry up. That's what I think. Um, but yeah, I work there, I work for this. This is my goal. Yeah. I'm 61 years. So hopefully I will see the first uh, first uh, equipment being built and being operated. Do you think you will? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Given that I can postpone my, my pension to uh, mm -hmm. 67, 68. Yeah, it's also have to see it from the, as a pensioner as well, right? So. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that would be great. It would be really great to, uh, to, uh, to see it all happening. Huh? You have very nice spots on the, on the coast that you can look down on the company. That would be great if we could really see this skyline change and the, uh, the chips and the chilies being less and less electric. Mm -hmm. This is a, uh, a dream, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of contradictions at play here. You're asking for the faith and the help of the Dutch people, while in the meantime, your employees in their group chats are saying that climate activists should be run over. You have criminal investigations, publication reports that are saying you're harming the health of the local populations, while well, on the same time, you're saying, well, you know, we are doing all we can. Do you really think it is realistic, taking all that into account? If you're asking if I sleep well, the answer is not, not really, actually. Eh? So there's, you're right, there's a lot to do. But there's also a lot to be gained. Mm. I mean, there's, 
you say our people uh, say something about the uh, the activists. Yeah, that's true. That's stupid. They should not have done that. Yeah, we are taking action in that. At the same time, our people are being called Nazis, murderers, child murderers. Uh, windscreens are being broken. All these kind of things are happening to our own people. Yeah? So, um, and that's what they're all, I'm also standing for. These now thousand and the 20, 30,000 around it as well. So there's there's a, uh, there's a lot to be to fight for and to to act in a way that we that we can continue in one way or another in in, in, in um, providing with all this eh, services and, and products mm -hmm. and developments and innovations. So when you when you finally will retire, you'll have to pull your hands off Kaiser Steel. You'll have to say, "This is it. This is my work." Are you going to sleep well after that? Depends on how it's going. There's a lot of uh, people are, who are retired around uh, the company, also directors, who are still very much involved in the company. Mm. And <laughs> I get al almost on a daily basis, I get emails from them, what I should do better. So it's like <laughs> almost a community now? Yeah. yeah, very strong community, yeah. Okay, so um, I think for our last uh, question for this interview, uh, we wanted to bring it back a little bit to the beginning again. So in the beginning we asked you, you know, why should you stay in the Netherlands? And uh, we also wanted to ask here, do you think that the, your company, which is Kata Steel and now, there's a large legacy there. Um, is your contribution to Dutch society net positive, so to speak? Yeah, I would say so. Yes, and then, uh, because if, if that's not so, there is no cause to exist. Yeah, and um, maybe it's, it's good to mention, we're part of the larger Tata Steel group, eh? or Tata group, actually. Yeah. In which is it stated that, that the community is not another stakeholder of the company, but the very cause of its existence. And I think that is very close to what we as, as Hoogovens in the past, yeah, and, and uh, up to now, also have been standing for. Yeah? We, 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 we are there, we are part of the, of the community, part of the society, and the, let's say the, the polarization that is now running up is, is hurting. It's hurting us, it's our, our employees, it's hurting the people in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the communities around it, also among each other. That's a situation which is not, um, which is not future proof, no. Yeah, okay. Absolutely not. I think with that we come to the, to the end of this interview. Thank you for being here today. Thank you to the audience for being with us here today. And uh, one final applause for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much.